So I'm very glad to introduce Sofia Colette Erich. You must excuse me for my pronunciation here, but you are uh, at the Koninklijke Nederlandse Academie van Wetenschappen, which would be roughly the, the Royal Dutch Acad Academy for, for uh, Science, I guess. And we will now get a presentation of this uh, that's named How Can We Smell History? Mapping out modes of olfactory event curation. So uh, working with different senses, I guess, in uh, exhibitions and historical environments, which is something that we have touched upon in early presentations today, but now we're going to uh, take a deep dive into the historical smell. So, with that said, I'm going to hand it over to you, Sofia, uh, and let's hope that the sound is okay. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, and it's it's really, uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me, and, uh, and also even though I only speak English, so this is really, uh, really amazing. Um, and also, it's such a great uh, follow up, I think, to William's presentation about uh, questioning uh, what is heritage and um, the authenticity of, of this and presenting uh, heritage in museums. So I think it's a great way to follow up that presentation. So um, I will now share my screen. Uh, I have some slides for you today. All right. I hope everyone can see that. Yes, we can. Great. Okay. Uh, so uh, my name is Sophia Eric, and I am an art historian, academic researcher, and curator of multisensory experiences for the Odoropa Project. My presentation is titled How Can We Smell History? Mapping Out Modes of Olfactory Event Curation. And today I will talk about multisensory museum practices, focusing particularly on creating and presenting a historically informed smell for an event within the cultural sector. So my presentation shares knowledge which I have acquired through personal research as well as through combined research done within the Odoropa project, which is a European funded Horizon 2020 project that advocates for smells and smelling as being an important part of Europe's tangible and intangible cultural heritage. One of the goals of the Odoropa project is to define and promote measurable standards and best practices for bringing smells into the museum, in addition to educating and training cultural heritage professionals in these strategies. The question of why and how uh, smells should be in the museum is at the forefront of our research. And throughout our first two and a half years, we have learned that the field of olfactory museology comes with many barriers, which need to be considered, evaluated, and resolved. Although smells, uh, smell and modes of olfactory storytelling in the, in the museum is not necessarily a new idea, a clear set of, of methods and practices for doing so safely and effectively is lacking. To use as examples for research within olfactory museology, Odoropa has put on five olfactory events which engage pioneers in the field of smell. By engaging with these individuals, we are able to learn how to improve pathways of engagement for olfactory interpretation, event design, visitor experience, and conservation. In addition to our own examples of olfactory events, we are also documenting and observing past and present uses of smells in heritage institutions. This evaluation helps us understand the current challenges of olfactory storytelling. Today, I will focus on the question, how can we turn a piece of history or heritage into a smell and make that into a memorable experience? To answer this question, I, I will first present two example, simple examples of common olfactory imagery or iconographies. Second, I will present Odoropa's methodology for developing a heritage smell with a perfumer. And lastly, I will show a few smell presentation techniques, highlighting one particular event that I curated which combined sensory and digital modes of engagement. 
So let's start by asking ourselves, what does one interpret into a smell? The truth is, many heritage institutions already have olfactory history on their walls and in their display cabinets. The first example I want to highlight is the scene of the Adoration of the Magi. Many of us can recall this biblical story, which takes place at the Nativity of Christ, when three kings present three gifts to the baby Jesus. But many do not realize that these two gifts are in fact smells, frankincense and myrrh. And these smells would have actually been worth as much as gold. Many museums have one, if not more than one of these depictions already in their collections. The second example I want to highlight is an olfactory object called a pomander. In the past, many thought that disease came from bad smells. Therefore, that privileged individuals of society would fill these silver jewels with good smells like resins and spices and attach them to their belt, keeping them easily accessible should a bad smell suddenly arise. In theory, by holding objects like these to their nose, disease would not be able to enter their nose and good health would remain. So now you have a topic or an olfactory story that you want to tell, but how do you take that piece of olfactory history and capture it into a bottle? Throughout the development of our olfactory events, we realize that creating a heritage smell with a scent designer is not an easy task. And a big part of this was that this process was interdisciplinary. To bridge some of these differences in work processes and help future collaborations with scent designers uh, and researchers and curators, the Odoropa team developed a perfumer brief or a document that walks individuals through the process of developing a smell with a perfumer. The contents of the perfumer brief was outlined based on the needs that came forward during the scent development activities between Odoropa researchers and perfumers, and with the increased interest for museums and researchers to use smell as a tool of storytelling in various ways, comes a dire need for a bridge of these disciplines through accessible modes of communication. And we hope that this document can uh, be this function, can uh, yeah, play this function. So the perfumer brief covers three uh, main roles. Number one is project management. And this includes information like the location of the event and the timeline, number of smells. Uh, number two is olfactory storytelling and historical background. This is the historic relevance of the smell, which usually requires some research. And number three is perfumer reflection which offers the scent designer or perfumer to reflect on the experience and explain how they interpreted the historic rele relevance behind the scent. And this part three of the perfumer brief is especially important and highlights a major challenge of developing historically informed olfactory interpretations. And this is transparency about the smell itself. This can be the full recipe or detailed information about the materials used, and it's an important step as it helps shape the historical accuracy of the smell. And although we cannot actually exactly smell the past, we aim to be as authentic as possible. So as an example of my last point, um, you can see here on the screen a comparison of the historic Plamanda recipe that Odoropa provided the IFF perfumers and the ingredients that perfu the perfumers used in their uh, final version. And I want to mention that IFF uh, stands for International Flavors and Fragrances, which is a large international fragrance company and offers often caters towards household uh, fragrances and food flavorings but it is also an important partner of the Odoropa project and has made most of the smells that we've used in our olfactory events. With the help of the perfumer brief uh, here, we learned that the IFF perfumers did not actually strictly follow the historic recipe that we provided, and they added oregano and emitted lemon. And this is key as it offered the opportunity to reflect and decide if these changes were historically accurate for the time and met the use of the pomander. In this case, based on other historic recipes, IFF's interpretation was appropriate. However, it raised interesting points in terms of creative liberty that we allow the perfumers um, to, to have in the, in the future. 
So now you have a story and you have a smell, um, but how do you present them? The Odoropa project has allowed us many opportunities to experiment with olfactory interpretation and design. For example, our olfactory guided tours uh, we that we created in collaboration with Museum Ulm in Germany, um, we offered the tour guides three different distribution methods, hand fans impregnated with scent to be wafted at large groups, wispies, which are a small device that puts out dry scented air, and blotters, which is are a stiff paper that can be dipped in scent. All modes of presentation uh, were well received by uh, the museum own tour guides. However, they found the wispies most effective um, as these ones were the ones you could uh, reuse over and over again and were easily prepared. So you can see uh, the curator there using it in um, front of one of the artworks. So within our project, uh, we were also able to experiment with longer lasting and more mobile forms of scent distribution, such as rub and sniff cards. Uh, to highlight some of the ways that smell has been paired with digital outputs, I would like to take a few minutes to discuss an event that I curated for Europa titled City Sniffers, a smell tour of Amsterdam's eco-history, which took place throughout uh, the summer of 2022. Um, I wanna start by emphasizing uh, the incredible teamwork that went into the City Sniffers event. Its development included the involvement of a historian, an art historian, perfumer, scent communications expert, graphic designer, and multiple application developers. And we collaborated with, scent, uh, with the scent communication expert, Scent the Brand, uh, who printed the map, graphic designer Liam Finley to design the map, and International Flavors and Fragrances, again, to develop the smell. And it was hosted by the Amsterdam Museum uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and I, I wanted to mention that uh, rub and sniff, it's also known as scratch and sniff. And it is what you think, uh, kind of like these uh, books that you used to use as a child and you were able to scratch and uh, the smell would release. Um, so the City Snippers tour follows a... Um, follows a path, one path of six stops with smells and stories within the city. Using a free phone application to navigate, which was developed by Odoropa researchers, participants could walk around smelling and exploring stories connected to the past and present history of Amsterdam. The phone application was a very important piece of the event as it not only linked to our phone's mapping application to bring you from stop to stop, but it also gave you extensive historical information and beautifully chosen images for each location and chosen smell, bringing you from the past to the present day. In order to keep participants engaged, each stop had a summarizing text and then went into three different expanding menus, exploring the different storylines that this smell could send you on. The tour smells were dispersed via a rub and sniff map containing five smells and a QR code to download the application on the back. To name a few highlights, the tour started at the Amsterdam Museum with the scent of rosemary, went on to the oldest apothecary of Amsterdam where participants could smell the smell of a civet cat in connection to the creation of historic perfumes. The fourth stop, which was a favorite of our participants, was an interpretation of the smell of a palm ender, which I explained uh, previously. And we courageously finished the tour smelling the stench of a 17th century canal in front of a modern day canal. Overall, the tour explored narratives around colonial histories, transportation, and the industry within Amsterdam. On the last day of the event, we had distributed a total of 500 rub and sniff, sniff maps and many people reported on the event. Overall, we had a very positive response and many have approached us asking for their own historical smell map. And we hope that the event will stand as a creative example of how museums can engage their visitors in digital olfactory storytelling. With the creation of City Sniffers, we were inspired to continue experimenting with different smell printing options. For example, last year we created two uh, printed smell cards for the American Historical Review Journal. You can see those uh, uh, two smell cards on the right side are um, the ones that I just mentioned for the American Historical Review Journal, and then the one on the left is from City Sniffers. 
The Liberty Bell smell card, uh, for example, was created to communicate the olfactory history behind the production of the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia, as well as the history behind abstract concepts like freedom and justice. Much like the city sniffers map, upon receiving the card, attendees of the American Historical Association Conference were able to scan a QR code, which led them to a website. There they could read Liberty Smells, the Stink of Politics and the Politics of Stink, a text written by historian William Tullett, especially for the card. These kinds of smell cards are effective in that, that they can be kept, carried, and revisited time and time again. To conclude, I hope that my presentation today has inspired you to follow your nose, and not only that, to trust your nose as a tool of exploring the past and the present. Thank you for listening and keep smelling. Thank you so much, Sophia. Uh, there has been some smiles and even some small laughters in the room here because there is, I think this is a fantastic subject and a way to, to approach heritage. Uh, I don't know if I have any questions in the chat now, but uh, I have one here. Uh, I, I, I think it's a, it's a fantastic job that you've done, <laughs> including including Thank smell, you. of course. Uh, but uh, you were giving an example on this um, pomander. What's that? What's that name? The po the uh, pomander. Pomander, where you use the recipe uh, for yeah. recreating the smell. But but how do you? How have you? Uh, how have you worked when you are doing the more abstract smells? I mean, the Liberty Bell, or or I, I wrote here. How does hell smell? Uh, <laughs> how do you how do you uh, approach such a smell or a work where when there is no recipe? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so within Odoropa specifically, we have a few historians who are uh, really looking through uh, historic texts and images to find. Um, evidence, I guess you could say, of, of what hell uh, would smell like, or, uh, for example, uh, freedom or liberty or something like this. So we, I, I have a lot of help there uh, from historians who, who um, have this kind of experience of looking for these kinds of uh, evidence. But it also is a bit of um, creativity, I guess, an interpretation. And there are many challenges that can come with that, right? For example, um, I've presented the smell of hell. Uh, sorry, siren for a moment. I've presented the smell of hell uh, in the museum in Ulm in front of that painting, which I showed you uh, with the curator. And you had people say, oh, no, that's not hell. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it, if this was hell, then I would live there. Or I had someone say, oh, I really liked this smell. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's one of the challenges that you have, have with using smell in the museum is that people have their very impulsive uh, and also pre-existing ideas of what things would smell like. Mm -hmm. um, so we try our best, but it's not always, uh, it's not always clear or is not always effective, right? That's uh, one of the risks. It's, I, thank you for that answer. I think it's fascinating to see that, that people don't agree on smell, but of course you don't agree with each other on the other senses as well, the things you see yeah. and things you hear. Uh, and I guess that's the same. Have you been working uh, with, with uh, groups? Because many of these examples were sort of individuals going around city. Have you been working with groups seeing, sort of discussing that question? Is this... Uh, true representation of this smell? Um, yeah, so we our one event was a guided tour. Uh, well, so there was City Sniffers, which obviously I I only got, we, we do some questionnaires um, and measurements of the events, which is one of the purposes of the events within the Odoropa project is, is to also do questionnaires which, which ask people like, uh, how, what, how was the event? Um, what value did you put on the event in terms of like the smell and the connection to history? Um, so I, I have a little bit of information about that tour through those questionnaires. But for the guided tours that, um, the, that were done in Ulm, for example, those were done by a, by a curator um, and not myself. But we did get some um, some feedback, uh, but usually it was positive. Um, but we had also some experiences where they had like very um, emotional uh, responses. So people would smell things uh, that were connected to the artworks and have very personal memories that would come up. 
um, especially for more of those abstract com- concepts again. Um, but for smells like the pomander, or we had a smell of perfumed gloves, those were really strong uh, and well, because they connected so well with the artwork and the, and the concept. It was kind of this tangible thing of this smell connects to this object and has a recipe, et cetera. So I think people can latch onto that a little bit more in terms of uh, perceiving the smell and the artwork and making that storyline connection. So there's this very strong connection uh, versus the more abstract concepts is kind of like, okay, um, this is the smell of hell, but I, I don't know that I necessarily believe it. Uh, so yeah, that's, again, kind of this interesting uh, dynamic between storytelling and smell and historic relevance. Thank you. We, we have actually got some uh, questions questions in the chat room as well. Um, um, let's see here. Do you have an experience in using smells to enhance accessibility to exhibitions uh, for visually impaired? Uh, yes, there's, well, there's also a few other re- uh, researchers that have, have done that. So um, Carl Verbake, uh has done this with uh, the visually impaired, where she's done a lot of uh, smell tours with, uh, with these kinds of individuals. And it has really um, helped in, in terms of their perception of, of, the, of the artworks and the space. Um, and also Marie Clapeau, who's at the Met uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, she's also used smell a lot in this way of accessibility. But we didn't focus on that as much uh, in the Odoropa project. Um, but there are many examples of this uh, in the past uh, uses of smell. And I think it's definitely a, a great uh, opportunity to uh, enhance and, and um, open up the question of accessibility in the museum, because a lot of people uh, who go to the museum, they feel a little bit overwhelmed by this idea that we're only supposed to visu- experience the space visually, and we're not necessarily supposed to have a lot of conversation or, um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think smell is a way to, to open that up a little bit more and open up the conversations as well as uh, open a, a different window of the brain. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for, for the next question here, have you experimented with combining several sensory experiences in the tours simultaneously, such as sound and smell or similar? Uh, I haven't personally, but I guess it depends on what you... Uh, what you consider uh, sound, if you mean music, no, but the, the guided tours were with um, like a guide. So a guide went through and, and gave a, a description. So I guess you could say that is a, uh, that is <laughs> multi-sensory or more senses than just smell. Um, for City Sniffers, I really wanted to have the texts read as well as uh, like read out in audio, but that was just something I didn't have time to uh, to achieve. But I think it's really nice because smell uh, is this additional um, additional sense and also additional like input of information. And so when you're trying to read and smell and all these things at the same time, it can become a bit. Yeah, a lot. So, so having something read to you or having a tour guide speak to you is a really nice way to incorporate um, the smells. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Let's see here. <laughs> the, the, the questions are just falling in now. Um, question from uh, Jasmine Beatrice here. Also, were the extension in postcards a result of what the museum learned during the Oda project time, or was it a part of the project? Um, if I understand the question, they're asking if uh, the yeah if if the creation of the cards were part of the the research of the project, or I, I, uh, if it was part of the project, or it was sort of uh, based on what you learned during the project, and was some oh extra thing. Um, well, it, it was part of the project. So originally, um, uh, like basically how the European uh, projects were, how these projects work is that there's like a description of an event um, written in the proposal, and then you have to somehow uh, create it. So the description was just like uh, smells uh, and an application being created. And so, um, yeah, we thought, well, how do we have smells 
and an application and a walk through a city. So it was an easy way, like this card was an easy way to have people go collect something, mm. have it in their hand, and then be able to walk around a city freely. So it was sort of part of the project, but also um, many of these distribution methods, yeah, we researched a bit and then um, incorporated them. But I don't know many museums, many um, museums and uh, that ha that are using a card in this way. Um, but it is very efficient, actually. Uh, <laughs> it works well. So, and that leads us to to the two two final questions here uh, from Victor, and I, I think I, I will because they are quite practical. Uh, how long will sm smells last in an exhibition before you need to replace or refill them? And do you have any practical advice for getting started when using smells in the museums? Uh, okay, for how long? Um, it seems like a simple question, but it's actually not such a simple question because it depends on uh, on the kind of project that you want to do. So if if you want to, uh, for, for example, with the guided tours in Ulm, if you want to just do a guided tour with some blotters, then you have the bottle of smell and you can pretty much do that anytime you want, right? You can dip these little strips in a bottle and... Uh, go have fun. But if you have like an exhibition space where you're setting up a, a bottle in, a, in an exhibition, I, I haven't done much research on this, but I, I would think maybe uh, every six months you would want to check on that, uh, that bottle to see, you know, how is it, how, how is it going? Is, is it still dispersing the smell? Also has it oxidized or something like this? Um, again, I'm raising more challenges than maybe solutions, but that's, uh, yeah, that's the nature of it with using smell. Um, yeah. Any advice for those who want to, who want to use smell? Um, yeah. Uh, I think biggest piece of advice would be if you want to use smell, uh, start researching early because these projects uh, can take, some time uh and some research and uh yeah t tender loving care i guess you could say to really like yeah to really get them going and and because it's still such a new field of research it takes some time to uh to yeah uh to implement into your space and um and also always if you want to incorporate smell in your museum to uh talk to your fellow staff members about it because some people will look at you like you're crazy and others will be like, Oh, that sounds really cool. Um, so to really have conversations and open, open up that, uh, that conversation with everyone. And, and so everybody is prepared. <laughs> Thank you. Tend love and care. Uh, but, <laughs> but you just, just to, to connect with what you just said, uh, have, have you met, resistance uh, among you know visitors or colleagues and things like that uh, introducing smell in this very um, systematic way in the heritage sector yeah i think the the um the biggest uh the biggest pro problem in the with smell in the museum or the biggest uh challenge and why people say no is uh from a conservation perspective because people uh are conservative conservators see it as a as a potential damage to the artworks or the collection um, so that's something that when you're looking at distribution methods that you really have to keep in mind um, that they don't disturb the artworks or don't let out um, liquids to to get onto the artworks and damage the collection so yeah conservators I think are are the most um, but for valid reasons, right? So um, I think it's always really good to to listen to them and and mm. know uh, why. Mm. Great. And and th then I think uh, talking a bit about the future, uh, we have a new question from Victor here. What do you think about the future for olfactory interpretations in the field of cultural heritage? If you want to take a wow, the future look in the um, crystal ball. Yeah, uh, I, I hope it becomes more common. I, I know that sounds really simple, but um, yeah, I hope that people keep using this uh, this way of, of interpreting artworks. I mean, 
um, I, I see it a lot in, 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 digital, uh, in digital media, right? That we were becoming so digital uh, and, and talking about immersivity, but then we don't talk as much about smell, <laughs> even though we all do it all the time. Uh, we're, we're all smelling right now, right? So it's so intuitive uh, to us um, that I think we forget about it. So just to, maybe this is the simplest answer, but just to like become more, uh, aware of our sense of smell and how powerful it is and continue to be open to these modes of interpretation in, within the cultural sector. So thank you for that (laughs) foresight in the future of uh, smell heritage. Thank you so much, Sofia, for your presentation.